Good morning, church. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a wage. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my wage? Just this, that in my proclamation, I may make the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might gain all the more. To the Jews I became a Jew as a Jew in order to gain Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might gain those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, though I am not outside God's law, but I am within Christ's law, so that I might gain those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, so that I may, might gain the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I might become a partner in it. The second reading is from Mark. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and he took her hand, by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening, at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed by demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went through all Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Bless the reading and hearing of God's word. Good morning, church. Good morning. This is a story about four people named everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. There was an important job to be done, and everybody was asked to do it. Everybody was sure somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. You may have heard this story before. You might even have lived this story before. It's a classic explanation for why no one takes action and crowds become bystanders. Another old saying claims that necessity is the mother of invention, and if that's true, then perhaps a few people step forward to take on responsibility if they don't need to. Only a few. We all have stuff going on. We have problems of our own and goals that may not align with what someone else is calling, is calling us to do. Some of us may even feel overwhelmed or, frankly, just exhausted. It's an interesting phenomenon to me that in American society, most people I speak with tell me that they are more busy after they retire during their career paid days. It's possible, I suppose, that because they're trying to give their pastor some excuse, but I tend to believe them. Maybe I'm just a pastor like that. At some point in high school, I was asked to memorize some of Hamlet's to be or not to be speech. To be or not to be. 
whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or by opposing to end them, to die, to sleep no more. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> you know the speech, right? And while some, sadly, of us may be contemplating such dire thoughts, the more frequent question that I find people asking themselves is, to act or not to act? Every day we question whether something is our problem or not, don't we? Somebody needs to tackle the injustices of the world, the environmental damage, the illnesses that still plague us, and the social inequities that still exist. The world, after all, we all know, has a lot of problems in it, so we can't, but we can't seem to manage to tackle them all. Despite the arrival of the internet that leads us to think that all of us can be experts on everything, it takes time and effort to properly explore some problems, brainstorm solutions, and organize people to make a change. It's important to discern our callings, and while we can support a variety of earthly transformations, we only have the resources ourselves to undertake a few. In some ways, this is what I see in today's gospel lesson from Mark. Jesus is in Capernaum, and is, is in, excuse me, in Capernaum, and as Alex shared with us in his sermon last week, Jesus has just finished healing the man in the synagogue on the Sabbath in very public fashion. That passage ended with Mark 1.28. Right away, the news about him spread throughout the entire region of Galilee. Now, Capernaum was a busy town, but small by our standards. Some historians think it was about 1,500 people. But Mark's hyperbole leads the reader to conceive of Jesus' healing of the man in the synagogue like an announcement that's gone out. It's as if everybody in town knew what Jesus did as soon as he walked out of the synagogue that day. Though it didn't exist then, it's as if somebody posted on social media, Jesus of Nazareth is healing people for free. Go find him. Everybody get over there right now. While the public is getting organized in the backdrop, Jesus, James, and John went home with Simon and Andrew, the scripture attests this morning. Jesus goes from public to private, from where everybody can see to Peter's home. Of course, this is the house of Simon, who Jesus would later nickname Peter. And in private, Jesus finds that there are people there also who need healing. Peter's mother-in-law, who sadly isn't named, was living with Peter's family. We don't know the circumstances that brought her under Peter's roof. Perhaps it was a long-term living situation, or it could have simply been because she was ill. But she was there nonetheless. In either case, Jesus is face-to-face -face with the personal hurt of one of his disciples, in this case, Simon Peter. Peter's loved one is sick with fever. Mark's gospel doesn't waste any time, and in verse 30 tells us the disciples told Jesus about her at once. Jesus goes to her, and without a word, he takes her hand, and the account says that he raised her up, in verse 31. Simply lifted her to her feet. The word here used for raised is the same word used to describe Jesus' resurrection. So in a sense, this tells us something about the severity of her condition. She was as good as dead until Jesus takes her hand, at least in Mark's eyes. The fever left her, Mark 131 joyfully announces, and she served them. Once again, the original language gives us the clue as to the nature of the service that this healed woman gave. In English, and perhaps revealing our own bias, it sounds like she got up and she baked something out of the kitchen for them, right? She got up and she served them, like food, like my Italian grandmother would put out antipasto, right? She got up and she served them all. Well, that's probably not exactly what they meant. The word in the original language is diaconio, the same word that we use to derive the words for deacons and deaconesses today. In some sense or another, she began to minister to Jesus and his disciples, however. Unlike the man publicly healed in the synagogue, this woman healed in Peter's home felt a calling to serve. This is the second healing that Jesus does on the Sabbath day. But there would be others soon. That evening, just as the Sabbath was ending, it seemed like the whole town was at the front door. The word about Jesus' public healing of the synagogue had been simmering for hours. People had been waiting until the Sabbath was over and maybe that controversial stuff they saw this morning was done. Now that there was no longer a prohibition against healing because the Sabbath was ended, they wanted Jesus to do for them what he did for the demoniac back in the synagogue. The scriptures don't tell us how long Jesus was at this for, but it does record that he healed many who were sick with all kinds of diseases, and he threw out many demons. Verse 31a. 
The next reference to time that Mark gives us is the next morning. But everything that has happened up to this point in our story has been rather exciting. Jesus has been walking around and seemingly healing people. However, what happens next in our story is where we as modern readers might take some issue. The next morning, before the crowds can return, Jesus was outside of town by himself. Mark tells us that Jesus wanted to be alone in prayer, it says in verse 37. Now on the inside, we're still cheering, right? Not only has Jesus had a full day of ministering to people, of healing people, of changing people's lives, but we might even feel ourselves excited that this healer takes time for some personal, private prayer practice. This is rather heroic to us when we feel so challenged to find even a few moments to pray or even make it here on a Sunday morning, right? This person that we so admire has taken personal time for prayer. He has an active prayer life, and God is as important to him in private as he is in public. The hero of our story, Jesus' re Jesus's retreat to pray to his God, reveals to us that even when Jesus achieves some local fame, he still has the integrity of a person who still listens for God's voice. And here is a man whose desire is to fulfill the work of the Lord, who is listening and compliant with what the Lord is asking of him. If the reader already suspects that Jesus is the Messiah, then this is already very exciting because Jesus is embodying the proper relationship of a good king who is sympathetic to the people but ultimately obeys the will of God. But the problem we have is with what Jesus does next. When the disciples eventually find Jesus and tell him, everyone's looking for him. There, was probably, there were probably people there who were very sick, some who had been ill for many years, and some whose lives might even have been threatened at that very moment. Yet Jesus answered them that it's time to move on to the neighboring towns. Well, that doesn't sit very well with me, Jesus. If this were to happen today, doubtless there would be a public inquiry, right? into how someone with the ability to heal could throw off their moral obligation in this way. Someone would likely sue him for negligence, and many more would turn to social media and call him out and denounce him in public fashion. Because as much literature and as many movies about heroes have explored at this point, when someone has the power to improve the lives of others, we demand that they use it. Everyone from doctors to those who took CPR training need to jump in if they see someone having a heart attack, after all. Rich people need to use their money to help those with less, and the calling of those with authority is to improve the lives of others. Indeed, with great power comes great responsibility, and that was either Spider-Man or originally the French philosopher Voltaire, depending on how well you know your history. We get so upset when someone seems to be doing nothing when the lives or livelihoods of people are in danger. The thought of Emperor Nero playing his fiddle while Rome burns is infuriating to our sense of moral justice, is it not? So what are we to make of a Jesus walking away from a crowd of people looking for healing? The explanation that Jesus gives to his disciples is that while he can heal, his main purpose is to proclaim the message. While still in the confines of his earthly body, Jesus is bound by many of the same limitations that we all have. He still needed sleep and food, Water, friendship, shelter, safety, and love. Time and energy were as much a limiting factor for him as they are for us. And though Jesus had tremendous compassion for all the people, there was a limit to what he could accomplish at any given time, at any given day. His answer to the disciples points to the fact that his main, his main purpose was to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of heaven. It wasn't to become a divine dispenser of healing. If people answered his call to the kingdom of heaven, then people would be healed, justice would be lived out, and equity would become a, day, a way of life. But if Jesus stayed there in Capernaum and continued to heal day after day after day after day, there would truly be no end to it. To restore those who fall ill to health is a good and powerful and important calling, but people will always continue to fall ill unless we change the structures that make them that way. Jesus understood that we have to work both ends of the problem, both the system and the symptoms. 
and we can't get bogged down in either one. To treat just the symptoms denies the existence of what's causing the suffering. And to spend all of our time advocating for systemic transformation can leave us out of touch with the real needs and solutions of real people while ignoring the suffering right before us. Christ needed to do both. And so does Christ's body still today, the church. Jesus' early ministry in Mark's gospel serves to remind us that there is a need for ministry in both the public and personal spheres. There is a need for us to do both ends. Now, each individual church might take its particular stance. Some churches will work to alleviate the symptoms, and others will work to advocate and cause and work for justice out in the world. And both are truly needed, and both are still part of the body of Christ. In some ways, churches, like so many other disciplines, in that way might sort of specialize and go forward in that way. But if Paul's advice to the body of Christ about making sure that if you're a hand, recognize that you're a hand, and if you're a foot, recognize you're a foot, means anything to us, it might remind us that all these parts are valuable to the body, and all these parts are needed. We both have to work for justice and equity in this world on a public scale and one-to-one. -one. Sometimes we feel our calling is to one or the other, and that's okay. But knowing where we stand and knowing what our calling is helps us to recognize the calling of others and to appreciate the calling of those around us. And perhaps knowing that they too, like us, are only human, need a little bit of compassion, a little bit of grace. It's hard, I think, for us to watch the news these days because the first thing that we hear is we hear lots of criticism, which sometimes is well-deserved. Sometimes there are the Neros playing the fiddle while Rome burns, and that should cause us some chagrin. But perhaps the things that are not that urgent, the things that, yes, we have a problem, but the people in charge may also need to take a rest once in a while and come back refreshed. Perhaps if we recognize that in our public officials, we might recognize that need in ourselves and give ourselves the grace that God gives the grace that Jesus gave himself to be able to step aside to renew and regenerate his relationship with his Father in heaven. If we give others that permission, perhaps one day we'll get around to giving it to ourselves too. So my prayer, church, is that we would be filled with grace, both for the people around us and for ourselves, because God loves you and cares for you always. And God seeks not only the good of the whole world, but also the good of each of us. So I pray you'll receive that peace and that grace this morning. And as we come to Christ's table today and receive that which Christ has offered to us, to nurture us, to give us what we need, that daily bread that we so thirst for, that it would fill your soul and encourage you today and always. In Jesus' name. Amen. May the peace that God has sown in our hearts this day grant us the grace that we need to live in a world that is often turbulent and troubled. Help us to bring hope where there is despair and peace to every person we meet. So now go in peace and let the peace of Christ dwell richly in your hearts.